The Scorch Trials, Chapter 26, on this PDF, page 90. For a second, Thomas had a hard time believing that this guy who dropped in literally was real. He was so unexpected, and there was an odd silliness about what he'd said and the way he'd said it. But he was there, all right. And even though he didn't seem quite as gone as some of the others they'd seen, he'd already confessed to being a crank. You people forget how to talk? George asked, a smile on his face that looked completely out of place in the shattered building. Or are you just scared of the cranks? Scared we'll pull you up to the ground and eat your eyeballs out. Mmm, tasty. I love a good eyeball when the grub's running short. Tastes like undercooked eggs. Minot took it on himself to answer, doing a great job of hiding his pain. You admit you're a crank. You're a freaking crank. That you're freaking crazy. He just said he likes the taste of eyeballs. This is from Fry Pan. I think that qualifies as crazy. George laughed, and there was a definite tone of menace in it. Come on, come on, my new friends. I'd only eat your eyes if you were already dead. Of course, I might help you get that way if I needed to. Understand what I'm saying? All mirth vanished from his expression, replaced with a look of stern warning, almost as if he was daring them to confront him. No one spoke for a long moment. Then Newt asked, How many of you are here? George's gaze snapped to Newt. How many? How many cranks? We're all cranks around here, Mono. That's not what I meant, and you know it, Newt replied flatly. George started pacing the room, stepping over and around Gladers, taking everyone in as he spoke. A lot of things you people need to understand about how things work in this city. About the cranks and wicked. About the government, about why they left us here to rot in our disease, kill each other, go completely and utterly insane. How about there's different levels of the flare? How about it's too late for you? The ill is going to catch you if you don't already have it. Thomas had followed the stranger with his eyes as he walked around the room making these horrible statements. The flare? He thought he'd gotten used to the fear of having the disease, but with this crank standing right in front of him, he was more scared than ever and helpless to do anything about it. George stopped near him and his friends, his feet almost touching Minot. He continued to talk. But that's not the way it's going to work, comprende. Those who are at a disadvantage are those who speak first. I want to know everything about you where you came from, why you're here, what in God's name your purpose could be, now. Minot let out a low, dangerous sounding chuckle. <laughs> We're the ones at a disadvantage? Minot swiveled his head around mockingly. Unless that lightning storm fried my retinas, I'd say there are 11 of us and one of you. Maybe you should start talking. Thomas really wished Minot hadn't said that. It was stupid and arrogant, and it could very well get them killed. The guy obviously wasn't alone. There could be a hundred cranks hiding out in the torn-up remains of the upper floors, spying on them, waiting with who knew what kind of horrific weapons. Or worse, the savagery of their own hands and teeth and madness. George looked at Minot for a long time, his face blank, you didn't just say that to me, did you? Please tell me you didn't just say that to me like a dog. You have ten seconds to apologize. Minot looked over at Thomas with a smirk. One, George said. Two, three, four. Thomas tried to shoot a look of warning to Minot, nodded at him. Do it. Five, six, do it. Thomas finally said aloud. Seven, eight. George's voice was rising with each number. Thomas thought he caught a glimpse of movement somewhere far above, just a blur of streaking shadow. Maybe Minot noticed it too. 
and the arrogance drained from his face. Nine! I'm sorry, Minot blurted out with little feelings. I don't think you meant that, George said. Then he kicked Minot in the leg. Thomas's hands clenched into fists when his friend cried out in pain. The crank must have gotten him right in a burnt spot. Say it with meaning, hermano. Thomas looked up at the crank, hated him. Irrational thoughts started swimming through his mind. He wanted to jump up and attack, beat him like he'd beaten Galley after escaping the maze. George pulled his leg back and kicked Minot again, twice as hard in the same spot. Say it with meaning! He screamed the last word with a harshness that sounded crazed. Minot wailed, grabbing the wound with both hands. I'm sorry, he said between heavy breaths, his voice strained and full of pain. But as soon as George smiled and relaxed, satisfied with the humiliation he'd inflicted, Minot swung an arm out and slammed it into the crank's shin. The man leapt onto his other foot, then fell, crashing to the ground with his own yelp a shriek that was half surprised, half hurt. Then Minot was on top of him, yelling a string of obscenities Thomas had never heard come out of his friend before. Their leader squeezed his thighs to trap George's body, then started punching. Minot, Thomas shouted, stop! He got to his feet, ignoring the stiffness in his joints, the soreness in his muscles. He took a quick glance upward as, it, as he made for Minot ready to tackle him off George's body. There was movement up there in several places. Then he saw people looking down, people readying to jump. Ropes appeared, dangled over the sides of the jagged holes. Thomas rammed into Minot, sent him sprawling off George's body, then crashed to the ground. Thomas quickly spun to grab his friend, wrapped his arms around his chest and squeezed against his struggles to escape. There's more of them up there, Thomas screamed in his ear from behind. You have to stop. They'll kill you. They'll kill all of us. George had staggered to his feet slowly, wiping a thin trail of blood from the corner of his mouth. The look on his face was enough to ram a spike of fear straight through Thomas's heart. There was no telling what the guy would do. Wait, Thomas shouted. Please wait. George made eye contact with him just as a few more cranks dropped to the ground from above. Some of them did the jump and roll like George had done. Others slid down ropes and landed squarely on their feet. All of them quickly gathered in a pack behind their leader, maybe 15 of them. Men and women, a few were teenagers, all filthy and dressed in tattered clothing, most of them skinny and frail looking. Minot had quite... Minot had quit fighting, and Thomas finally loosened his grip. By the looks of it, he had only a few seconds before a dire situation turned into a slaughterhouse. He pressed one hand firmly down on Minot's back, then held the other up toward George in a conciliatory gesture. Please give me a minute, Thomas said, urging his heart and voice to calm down. Won't do your people any good to hurt us. Won't do us any good, the crank said. He spat a wad of red goo from his mouth. It'll do me a lot of good. That I can guarantee, hermano. He balled both hands into fists at his side. Then he cocked his head barely enough to be noticed. But as soon as he did, the cranks behind him pulled all kinds of nasty things from within the depths of their ragged clothes. Knives rusted machetes, black spikes that had maybe once been in a railroad somewhere, shards of glass with red tinged smudges on their razor thin tips. One girl, who couldn't have been more than 13 years old, held a splintered shovel, its metal scoop ending in a jagged edge like the teeth of a saw. Thomas had the sudden and absolute certainty that he was now pleading for their lives. The Gladers couldn't win in a fight against these people. No way, they were grievers. They weren't grievers, but they also, but there also wasn't a magic code to shut them down. Listen, 
Thomas said, slowly getting to his feet, hoping Minot wouldn't be stupid enough to try anything. There's something about us. We're not just random shanks who showed up on your doorstep. We're valuable, alive, not dead. The anger in George's face lessened ever so slightly, maybe a spark of curiosity, but what he said was, what's a shank? Thomas almost, almost laughed, an irrational response that somehow would have seemed appropriate. Me and you, 10 minutes, alone, that's all I ask. Bring all the weapons you need. George did laugh at that, more of a wet snort than anything. Sorry to burst your bubble, kid, but I don't think I'll need any. He paused, and it felt like the next few seconds lasted a full hour. Ten minutes, the crank finally said. Rest of you stay here, watch these punks. If I give the word, let the death games begin. He held out a hand, gesturing to a dark hallway that led from the room on the side across from the broken doors. Ten minutes he repeated. Thomas nodded. When George didn't move, he went first, walking toward their meeting place and maybe the most important discussion of his life. And maybe the last.